Hey, I'm here in Auburn, Indiana at Worldwide Auctioneers. Uh, they have a, a one-day auction in the spring, the Enthusiast Auction, here in April 2023. Uh, and uh, I've actually uh, got media passes for this one. Uh, so we're going to go and take a look at some of the cars they've got. They've got some of the nicest cars you're going to see here today. Uh, I, they've got about 90 vehicles. I'm not going to have time to cover all of them, unfortunately. Uh, so uh, some of the cars that you see in the background that might be some of your favorites, I apologize for not hitting them. But uh, I'm going to put a link uh, down in the description to uh, their, uh, their uh, website so that you can see uh, the entire auction uh, simulcast along with the auction results, if, uh, if that's what you so choose. But anyway, uh, let's go take a look at some of the cars they've got and uh, have a good time today. We're going to kick things off by looking at this sweet 1938 Bantam Roadster. Uh, this is a small car. It has a 45 horsepower engine, but uh, great power to weight ratio. It gets about 50 miles to the gallon, causing some people to say that this is America's first economy car. Two years after this car was produced, Bantam would go on to design the very first Jeep. Bantam had started in 1935 when two Americans bought the bankrupt remains of American Austin. American Austin was an attempt to bring the Austin 7 to American shores, but it really just didn't gel. Are you in the mood for something French? Here's a 1972 Citroën DS. The Space Age Citroën was introduced in 1955 and had a reputation for quality engineering. One of the things I think are kind of cool about this car is that it has headlights that turn with the steering wheel. So these are directional headlights. The DS was also the first production car to use hydrodynamic self-leveling suspension and disc brakes. I really like the steering wheel. The single spoke is a Citroen trademark. And this is uh, for a clear view of the dash, but also for safety. The single spoke is there to direct you away from the steering column towards the center of the car in case of an accident. Uh, also, the spare tire is in front of the engine. Uh, you can see the very long hood there and uh, the very short trunk. Here's something special from a little closer to home. In 1931, Ford ended production of the Model A, and in 32 introduced the short-lived Model B, which had an improved four-cylinder engine, but also introduced the V8. The flathead Ford V8 introduced with the Model 18 here in 1932. When the Beach Boys sang about a little deuce coupe, they're talking about the 1932 Ford. This Roadster version is a rare, unmolested car, still wearing its original 65 horsepower flathead. Ford's powerful new Roadster was hopped up and modified with speed equipment practically from day one. These hot Roadsters gave birth to the term hot rod. Given their popularity with modifiers since they were built, Unmolested examples like this are very hard to find and really something special when you see them. This is a great car. Moving up to a little bit newer collector car, here's a 1983 Datsun 280ZX. When the first 240Z showed up on American shores in 1970, it showed that Japan could really produce a competitive performance car. Since then, they've become a collector's item. This one has original factory T-tops. T-tops are always fun. And inside, there's all the early 80s goodness that people love. This one is a very low mileage, unrestored original, still with the original 197 horsepower inline six and a five speed manual transmission. Speaking of performance cars, here's one and then some. This is a 1967 Shelby GT500. Starting in 1965, Ford worked with racing legend Carroll Shelby to take factory Mustangs and turn them into performance monsters. Those were the GT350s. They used a performance 289 engine. The GT500 used a 428. If that's not special enough, this one is autographed on the dash by the man himself, Carroll Shelby. Moving back to the 30s, I super like this 1937 Packard Coupe. Like all luxury car makers, Packard faced its challenges during the Depression. They did all right, though, by introducing a less expensive Packard 120 series. The 120 series was priced under $1,000 and featured an inline eight-cylinder engine. This is not that car. 
This is a Packard 12 that has a flippin' V12 engine under the hood. What really knocked my socks off on this car is the fact that it's wearing the original paint. Look at the patina on this thing. It's got the dual side mounts. It's got a deluxe radio. It's got a deluxe heater. Everything that money could buy. It's all in a nice coupe package with a rumble seat in the back. I picked this car out as the car at the auction I would most like to have. It's still the Depression, though, so Packard was only able to make 42 of these B12 coupes in 1937. I don't know how many of those 42 cars still exist, but certainly none of them are as an original condition as this beautiful car. Let's take a look at another Depression-era rarity. This one is a 1934 Cadillac 8 stationary coupe with body by Fleetwood. Cadillac was having a tougher time than most during the Depression, and between 1928 and 32, sales volume had dropped 84%. 1934 represents the year that streamlined styling really took hold at Cadillac with all new designs, and sales did rebound a bit. Even so, between 1934 and 37, only 45 Fleetwood-bodied Cadillacs were built. This car represents the only survivor of a V8 in this style. I really like the little jump seats behind the driver's seat. I don't think I've ever seen that in a coupe. This car has won best in class at the Pebble Beach Concours d'Elegance and is just a stunning piece of machinery. Speaking of stunning machinery, let's look at this 1949 Jaguar XK120. The XK120 was introduced by Jaguar in 1948 with an all-aluminum body. By 1950, the body was switched to steel to meet the demands of mass production. Only 242 aluminum-bodied XK120s were made. This makes the early production 1948-49 120s very desirable. The 120 in the name, by the way, stands for 120 miles per hour. Actually, the XK120 could do a little bit more than that, but at the time of its launch, it was the fastest production car in the world. Hey, if you just watched my last video on the history of Cord, you might pick up right away that this is a Cord L29. This is an early production 1929 model. In fact, it's chassis number 21. They estimate that there's really only about 300 L29s still in existence. You know you're dealing with a classy car when you got the special door back here just for your golf bag. Unfortunately, the stock market crash in October 1929 made it poor timing to introduce a new luxury car. This world's first successful production front-wheel drive car is interesting mechanically, though. For instance, the front brakes are right up tight against the front differential, right there. They're not out on the wheels like you would expect them to be. That's one of the little things I didn't get to mention in my last video. Anyway, I always like to see them. They're just neat cars, both stylistically and mechanically. Hey, remember that V12 Packard that I was phoning over just a couple minutes ago? Well, here's a 1931 Cadillac that takes that a step further. Right underneath the Flying Goddess Hood ornament, we see that this is, in fact, a V16. Let's take that V12 and just add four more cylinders to it. Yeah, Cadillac went there. The Caddy V16 has a reputation for running whisper quiet and smooth as silk. This is a top-of-the-line machine. Let's move up to 1966. You heard me mention earlier the Shelby GT350s. Those are the Mustangs that were specially prepared by Carroll Shelby for performance. Well, here's one of those, but this one's a little more special even than that. This one is a GT350H. The H stands for Hertz. Yeah, the rental car company. As a cross promotion in 1966 between Ford and Hertz, 1,000 special Shelby GT350s were available across the country at Hertz locations to rent by the general public for $17 a day. It was called the rent -a racer program, and as you might expect, these cars were used, abused, and racing parts stolen from them. So the 350Hs are rare to find today. So if you see an old barn with a 66 Mustang in raven black with Le Mans gold striping, pay careful attention. I make no secret of the fact that I really like airflows, like this 1934 DeSoto SE version. 
The design was wind tunnel tested with the help of Orville Wright, who had a little bit of experience with wind tunnels. The car was ahead of its time in other ways, too. The engine was moved as far forward as possible to make more legroom for the driver and passengers, and this was an early adoption of unibody construction. Unfortunately, the design was just a little too radical for buyers in the 30s, and the airflow was phased out after just a few years. All right, I think it's time to talk about the Delahaye in the room. What we have here is a 1936 Delahaye 135M Competition Court Cabriolet. For those that don't know, Delahaye is a French automaker that made some very successful race cars. On top of that, we've got a body by Fagoni and Falache. Designer Giuseppe Fagoni was a master of these sweeping, streamlined shapes that are just works of art to behold. Although it's a convertible cabriolet right now, this car actually started off life as an enclosed coupe. Here's a picture of it racing in 1936. That's it there, car number 28. It had a successful racing career up until the start of World War II. At that point, it was hidden in a barn in central France under hay bales to prevent it from being confiscated by the Nazis. It resumed racing after the war. Uh, there it is out front, car number two in a photo from 1948. Shortly after that photo was taken, race car driver Andre Biff's girlfriend expressed an interest in having a convertible to tour the countryside. So he did what any good boyfriend would do, and he took the race car to a coach builder and had it modified from a coupe to a cabriolet. The car has undergone a full restoration, and even among the world-class cars here today, this is a showstopper. Well, here's a showstopper of another kind. This is a 1967 Volkswagen Deluxe Samba 21 window microbus. Except something doesn't look quite right here. That's right, those are Porsche Fuchs rims. Why does a Volkswagen have Porsche wheels? Well, because that's not the only thing Porsche about this microbus. The VW bus used the same engine as the VW Beetle, and they were notoriously underpowered. They did zero to 60 and you gotta be kidding me. That's why this one has a six cylinder engine out of a Porsche 911. That ought to give it some get up and go. What do you think? Is the 911 swap a good idea or does the bus lose some of its charm? The inside with the walk through front bench seats has been meticulously restored. Up next, we have a Duesenberg J boat tail speedster, or is it? This is actually a 1980 Duesenberg II. Neoclassics were popular in the late 70s and 80s, and many of them were produced. This is actually one of the best of the lot. This is a high-quality, hand-built car from Elite Heritage Motors out of Wisconsin. From 1978 to 2001, they managed to make only 71 cars, but the build quality was so good that Tom Monahan bought this one. If you're not from Michigan, you may not be familiar with that name, but he's the founder of Domino's Pizza, the former owner of the Detroit Tigers, and a noted car collector. The cars were built as close as possible to original while retaining modern conveniences. They were powered by Ford V8 engines and had automatic transmission, cruise control, modern stereos, and air conditioning. Those original Duesenberg lines are as eye-catching as ever. Here's a first-generation Ford Bronco. These things have become highly desirable collector vehicles, and clean examples are getting hard to find. The first generation lasted from 1966 to 1977. This one's actually a 1975 model. This is a clean one-order truck that's had a recent frame-off restoration. It has the correct Ford 302 and optional Cruise-O-Matic automatic transmission. The cowhide upholstery is not original, but I think it looks pretty cool. I'm not sure how the cowhide is to sit on, though. Air conditioning has also been added for further comfort. Competition at the time included the Toyota Land Cruiser, the International Scout, and the Jeep CJ5. We'll take a look at one of those CJ5s in just a couple of minutes. Here's a 1928 Stutz BB Dual Cowl Speedster. 
As soon as you heard me say Stutz, the first thing that popped into your mind was probably the Stutz Bearcat. Stutz was well known for making fast cars and they were very competitive on the racing circuit. They pioneered the use of dual overhead cams in the mid-teens. They also made some very nice luxury cars like this full-on classic. Remember when I referred to this as a dual cowl speedster? What that means is when the top is down, the backseat passengers have their own little windshield here. There's a lot going on in terms of steering wheel mounted controls on this one. What I really think is neat though is how you get into the back seat. You open the back door, but then you have to hit a little release pin and lift up a part of that cowl to get into the seat. It's actually kind of neat. Next up is one of Stutz's competitors. This is a 1922 Mercer Series 5 Raceabout. Mercers are very rare these days. You almost never see them. This one has kind of an interesting history. It was sold to a Venezuelan general and changed hands several times in Venezuela before being imported back into the United States. The competition between Mercer and Stutz led to the saying, you must be nuts to drive a Stutz. Stutz retorted, Nothing could be worse than a Mercer. Of course, today they're both viewed as equally great cars. One of the interesting things here is the little pump on the side. If you ever wondered what that is on some early race cars, that's actually to pressurize the gas tank. This is a gravity feed gas tank. Uh, so uh, every now and again, you wanna keep pressure above the gasoline on the tank to kind of force that into the carburetor. It's on the passenger side because that's what your riding mechanic does. Remember on early race cars, there was seating for both a driver and a mechanic. Overall, very nicely done restoration on an excellent car. All right, 1955 Pontiac Star Chief convertible. The Star Chief is the absolute top of the line for Pontiac. Like all GM cars, it received an all new design for 1955. I really like the accessory light-up hood ornament on these things. It's really cool. When I was a little kid, my uncle owned a 55 Pontiac briefly, and I got a ride in it, and it just, like, struck me as a beautiful car. And to this very day, whenever I see one, I just have this childlike joy. I just love 55 Pontiacs for really no discernible reason. There is a discernible reason to love this one, though. This is a special order factory paint job in Castle Gray and Bolero Red that just sets this car off like nothing else. It's a beautiful convertible with color matched interior and under 50,000 miles on the clock. 1948 Packard Station Sedan. Very, very beautiful car. This is not as long a wheelbase as competitive station wagons, so there's no third row seating here. Uh, what we're looking at is the straight eight Packard engine. Also, unlike competitive woody wagons at the time, the wood is not used structurally here. This is all steel construction with the northern birch applied over that more ornamentally than structurally. Today, these things are kind of rare to find. Hey, I told you we'd talk about a CJ5. This is a 1955 first year of introduction has the correct engine and three-speed manual transmission. This is a very nicely done military tribute vehicle. An actual military version is the M38A1, and uh, that has a few little subtle differences. I really like the canvas top with the full side curtains. This would be a fun car. They made the CJ5 all the way up until 1983, so this is a very long-running and popular 4x4. I really like the 1958, 59, 60 Lincoln design. I think it's just really cool. This is a 1960 Continental Mark V. One of the neat features on this year Lincoln is the reverse slanted rear window that rolls down, even on the convertible. And the whole convertible top, power rear window and all, automatically folds down and puts itself in place. It's a real mechanical marvel. Now you heard me call this a Mark V, and you might be thinking, isn't that the one they made in the 70s? Well, yes, but no. When the 1969 Continentals came out, Lincoln started the numbering system back over again at three. So the 1977-79 Lincolns were also called Mark V. Speaking of mid-century luxury, here's a 1958 Cadillac Fleetwood Series 60 Special Hardtop Sedan. 
This was an all-new body design for Cadillac for 1958. One of the things I like is the GM Autotronic Eye. That's that little spotlight-looking thing. Uh, what that is is a photo sensor that will automatically dim your headlights when it senses oncoming traffic. There were several 1950s Cadillacs here, and I really kind of went back and forth in terms of which one to cover, but in the end, it was the Tahitian coral paint job that really won me over on this one. Just a beautiful car. The last car I'm going to cover before we get to some auction results is this 1907 Shocked. I've actually seen this car before. It was for sale at Hershey last October with a $55,000 asking price. We'll see how close to that number they actually can get. That uh, tall basket there on the side, that is an umbrella basket. That is strictly for your parasol. In the back, we've got the hand crank for starting the two-cylinder, 12-horsepower engine. Power is transferred to the wheels through dual chain drive, so uh, both rear wheels are driven. Now that I look at it, either that radiator doesn't get really hot or you just learn real quick not to put your feet on it. Also up front, there is a buggy whip for auxiliary power, or more likely somebody just was being funny at some point and added that there. Anyway, neat little feature. I do want to mention, though, that this auction had a lot of memorabilia, along with some just really knock-your-socks-off neon. Unfortunately, time constraints just didn't allow me to cover it. I do want to give you some auction results, though, from the cars that I covered. Well, let's go look and see what some of these cars are worth. All right, I'm going to try and blaze through these pretty quick. Each car in turn comes up on the fancy schmancy stage, and then the current bid amount is displayed up on the Jumbotron in dollars, pounds, and euros. The 38 Bantam sells for, drum roll. So, Bobby's better, 25,000, even number 501. Up, we've got that 72 Citroen. Sold 37,000, going to a good collection. Next up, we've got that beautiful 1932 Ford Roadster. That sold for 50000 even. Was the crowd in the mood for some imports? Well, that 83 280ZX sold for $27,000. I should mention on top of the hammer price, the buyers are also paying a 12% buyer's premium on the first quarter million and then 10% thereafter. All right, let's see what this GT500 brings. 144,000 as it turns out. Ooh, there's that very original 37 Packard. 62,500 takes it home. The extremely rare Cadillac stationary coupe. Well, that changed hands for 245,000. Next up, we've got that aluminum bodied XK120. Well, that was bid to $170,000, but did not sell. It had a reserve on it that was something higher than that. 1929 Cord L29. That one sold for $90,000. The 1928 Cadillac V16 Monster sold at $390,000. All right, here comes that 1966 GT350H. Well, that went for 170000 The 34 DeSoto, another one of my favorites. Well, honestly, they're all my favorites. Sold for $50,000 even. All right, here's that fantastic 1936 Delahaye. Let's see what this thing brings. The first bid they get is 500000 It moves pretty quickly up to 900000 Then nine fifty. A million is bid, ladies and gentlemen. One million is bid. One million. Then a million twenty-five. Bids are jumping in $25,000 increments. Final hammer price, $1,050,000. All right, let's take a look at this 21 window with the Porsche engine. 125,000 takes it home. All right, let's see what that 1980 Duesenberg II brings. 155,000 as it turns out. Moving on to that 1975 Bronco, that sold for 120,000. Next up, that dual cowl Stutz. 95,000 was the final price on that one. 
Now the Stutz competitor, the 1922 Mercer. That one's going to a collection in Texas for 175,000. 1955 Pontiac Convertible, $37,000. Next up, we've got that 48 Packard Station Sedan. That got bought for $29,000. That 1955 Jeep with the cool looking canvas, $12,000. All right, so I got it right across the stage in a 1935 Ford, so I missed that 1960 Lincoln, but it went for $61,500. I did make it back in time for that 1958 Cadillac with the Tahitian coral paint. That found a new home for $46,000. Last but not least, that 1907 Shocked, made in Cincinnati, Ohio, by the way. That changed hands for $37,500. Well, that was the Enthusiast Auction in Auburn, Indiana, Worldwide Auction Company. Uh, Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you want to see some of my other videos, there should be a link right about here to some of the other videos. And right about here, uh, there's a link uh, to subscribe to my channel if you want to see some more car content. I'm covering just about anything car related. Uh, anyway, hope you had a good time. I'll talk to you later. Bye.